talk to Christine all the time. It's probably yes. looking off in the distance, <laughs> holding a VA above her head. So, <laughs> okay. Well, welcome back to the second flight of the French Wine Academy in Bordeaux. And here we're going to encounter something that's unique to Bordeaux and is really of significant interest because it adds, of course, a layer of complexity, but even more importantly, it affects how the wines are priced to this day. So it's this amazing thing of the wines are... <laughs> oh, I figured that would happen. Like, no, we'll, just, we'll just we'll restart the fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, do they think the doors just locked the front? We're yeah. closed. We're oh. closed. <laughs> Oh, because the sign says, like, yes, we're open. Yeah, I know. We need to take it down. But, yeah. But, yeah. I don't know what they're going to do here. So, but. Okay. The, the door is locked for a reason. You want me to start over? or it's Whatever you want to do. I, I, I just deleted that. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you might Okay, well. yeah. Like, so so, okay. Welcome back to the second flight of the French Wine Academy, the Bordeaux session. Now, here... I think this is a particularly interesting flight because we're going to encounter something absolutely unique to Bordeaux, unique to France, and of course unique to the world. And it's a classification system of these wines that doesn't exist anywhere else. And the other amazing thing is that this classification system has never been changed. An unchanging classification system, yet to this day it still affects the price of Bordeaux wines. And what we'll see in the third flight is it also makes Bordeaux have some winners and some losers, and that's a lot of money that we're talking about in the pie. So it's worth exploring these wines and thinking about the classification system that Bordeaux has to its uniqueness. Now with that, I do want to hold on just a little bit to our idea that Bordeaux wines can express terroir. We saw it in the first flight with Gras, the left bank, and the right bank, and we're going to focus pretty deeply on the left bank at this point in time in this flight. The reason being is that's where the classification system sits, and it's the most important one, although there are others. And also, it gives us a chance to explore the major villages of the left bank and think about how those wines taste. But let's get to this unique classification system. Now, the system that I'm discussing is called the 1855 Grand Cru Classé, um, or the 1855 Grand Cru System. It's one that was put into place by Napoleon III for the Paris Exposition in, you might have guessed, 1855. His thought was that he wanted to showcase the greatest French wines, and therefore the greatest wines in the world, to the world. Hence, having uh, the Paris Exposi Exposition and showing the wines there. The question was, which were the greatest wines in the world at that time, or excuse me, what were the greatest French wines in the world at that time? To answer that question, Napoleon III, you might say, took a shortcut. And the shortcut he took was he asked the Bordeaux merchants which wines were the best. Now, this is great for me as a merchant of wine because it's very easy for me to tell you which wines are the best. The wines that are the best are the most expensive. And that's actually exactly what Bordeaux merchants did, is they said, well, the best wines are the ones that are selling for the highest prices. And they developed a system that, frankly, ranked the wines on the prices that they sold them at. Now, that ranking system is still in existence to this day. And again, it's known as the Grand Cru Classé system. Now, how it works is it's a ranking system, and it's kind of like a pyramid divided into five layers. And those five layers go one, two, three, four, five. And you'll have to excuse me, I can't pronounce correctly in any language, so I can't hit how the French call them. But one is the top, and five is the bottom. 
So if you're drinking a wine at number one, you are drinking the absolute top of Bordeaux. You are drinking one of the best wines in the world. Now, this system sometimes gets changed over and the word growth comes up a lot. I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. We'll explain why in a touch. But what you get here is you'll get people talking about first growths, second growths, third growths, fourth growths, and fifth growths. And the idea is that, again, first growths are at the top of the pyramid and fifth growths are at the bottom of the pyramid. So a very easy way for all of us to understand which wines are the absolute best in the world. Now, this system has changed slightly. Now, let me qualify that. Most people who drink Bordeaux and talk about Bordeaux will say, as I did in the introduction to this flight, this system has never changed. There, because it's France, always exceptions to the rule. One thing for us to know is that there are only about 60 chateaus involved in this system. That's changed a little bit because of mergers or fragmentations in the chateaus, but only around 60. The other thing is that the ranking system has never changed either. Now again, this being France, the very famous exception is that Mouton Rothschild in 1975 was moved from a second growth to a first growth. So now, in this day and age, we have five first growth wines, five best wines of the world. So, never changing except for that one exception and ranking in this way. First growth down to fifth growth. Now, I think the fun thing for us is to explore, well, does it matter? And that's part of why we have this flight set up for us. So if we start and we take a taste and a smell of the Belle Grave, what we have here is a wine that's actually a fifth growth wine. So you could say, oh, this wine is the bottom of the barrel as a fifth growth. Now, the important thing to understand here is this is somewhat like the United States Senate. Once you're elected a member of the United States Senate, you're, even if you're a junior member, you're in a rather exclusive club for everyone else considered in the United States. In Bordeaux, by 2014, there were around 8,000 producing chateaus. So if you're in the top 60, you're still in a rather exclusive club. So if you think I was selling you kind of a hogwash wine at 50 bucks, realize that again, there's a lot more that could be considered lesser, but Again, we need to explore that. So here, Belle Grave is a fifth growth, and I think it's an interesting one for us to taste, considering that we just finished in the last flight with that Saint Emilion. And here we get a very strong dominance of Cabernet, and we get a strong dominance of Cabernet in an area that's just outside of San Estef. Beau Grab was actually King Louis's hunting lodge. So if you go to San Estef, which is the northern village of the left bank, you actually hit the woods pretty quickly. So this was an area that King Louis could jump on his horse and take his dogs and go hunting and still have wine when he came back. Now with that, Beau Grab's Cabernet, I think, shows very strongly through in a bright red fruit character. Last flight, we had mostly wines that, whether they were Merlot or Cab, showed us black fruit aromas and showed us some gravelly character or some plump richness to them. Here, I think you get the more red fruit of Cab and its ferrous nature showing through. Also, this one is strongly dominant of Cabernet, and because of that, I think it's one of the most youthful ones that we're going to taste on the flights that we're having. It's fairly strident on the palate right now, being only five years old, but I would suggest to you that it can age fairly well and will continue to age. Okay, let's return to this system though, and if you're from Wisconsin, you'd be used to double fisting wines, so you could take both glass of uh, the Belle Grave and then the Brunner du Cru, and you could smell back and forth and taste back and forth between these wines. Now for us, 
an interesting thing is that we're going from Belgrave as a fifth growth up to Bronner de Cru as a fourth growth. So here, the idea would be that the wine would be better. Now, there are a couple of ways that the wine can hit the road here and we can explore it. One thought would be is, well, we've seen a pyramid from me before and the place we saw it before was in Burgundy. And in Burgundy, they rated vineyards. So you had vineyards that were, or wines that were from vineyards that were regional, village, specific vineyards, Premier Cru, and Grand Cru. That is not the case here, and it's important to realize this. This is actually a rating system that is based on the chateaus themselves. It is not based on the idea of terroir. That's probably a little bit harsh, and that's certainly not what a Bordelais would tell you, but what I can say is all of this is divorced from the vineyards. And how do I know that? It's because if a fifth growth buys land in Bordeaux, thus expanding their holdings, those vineyards become a fifth growth. If a first growth, the top of the charts, buys land in Bordeaux, that land actually becomes first growth. They can make first growth wine out of it. So if you think about it, here is the antithesis of, if you will, the Burgundian idea of terroir. And I think this is the real controversy nowadays with this system and how people reflect on this system, is, well, you know, if Lafitte buys land from a fifth growth, suddenly that land becomes first growth. But if we're used to drinking in Burgundy, where the monks said, well, because of the soil slope aspect, and grape we planted, that particular place makes very special wine. That's not what holds in Bordeaux. So, Bordeaux has a little bit of commercialism to it, would be the negative side of it. But for us, the other thing is, by and large, based on market value, this system fairly strongly holds to this day. Meaning that if it's a fifth growth, it will generally sell less than a first growth. If it's a second growth, it'll sell for more than a third growth. So it's an interesting comparison here because we've let market forces determine what these wines are, and we continue to let market forces determine what these wines are, and by and large, they solve out. In fact, there are companies that buy and trade Bordeaux, like stocks and bonds, and by and large, they will slot into these um, first through fifth growth comparisons. So it's a wild idea, and it's very different than the rest of France, and it's the only place that it goes on. Now, for us, again, let's go back, and we can taste these two side by side, the Belgravas the fifth growth, and the Brunner de Cru as the fourth growth. Now, I think there is actually a significant difference between the two of these, and one of the things that I notice is the Brunner de Cru has a bit more ripeness to it, and it has a bit more of that black fruit character, and takes some of the brighter red fruit character that the Belgrave has, and shifts it over to a black fruit character. Now, I have to say that I think this is personal preference on the smell of the wine, whether you like it to be a more bright red fruit character or you want it a darker, more impactful character to it. Now, I often happen to notice, and it's something to be thought of, is that these wines aren't just made in a historical context that follow a particular pattern that they do year after year after year. Some chateaus do that, but not many anymore. And I would suggest that it's probably because Bordeaux is a rather large commercial enterprise. So Bronner de Cru, while it's a fourth growth, one of the complaints that's been leveled about it over the years is that it's a fourth growth that has become very modern in its style. Meaning that it 
has a fairly high extraction of relatively high alcohol and also a fairly high oak character to it. It's a wine that, to blunt that criticism or to shorten that criticism, was maybe made for the American market and specifically made for one man, Robert Parker, and the idea that Robert Parker would reward this wine fairly heavily. Now I have to tell you, I don't think that's been the case at Bronner de Cru for probably at least a decade. But the criticism is interesting to think about. Now it relates back to this, and it also relates back to our history of Bordeaux and the British wine trade. Now by the 1700s, the British were in Bordeaux as wine merchants and very much dominated that trade. And by and large, they still do. Now you take this system in 1855 and you couple it with a very substantial wine trade and you have a really easy way to commercialize wine. And one way that you can commercialize wine is you can sell it on futures. Now some wine in this world is sold on futures, but all of Bordeaux's Cru Class A wines are sold on futures. What is futures? Futures is the fact that in Bordeaux, you can buy wine two years before it's bottled. The idea is, as consumers and clients, you get a discount and a value on that wine. You're paying the chateau early, and so you get the best possible price. Two years later, when the wine comes out, it's much more expensive. And that system worked for a very long time. I would say in my professional career, that system really started to change with the 2000 vintage and also the 2005 vintage. Those vintages really saw that the futures price was sometimes extremely high and the wines didn't necessarily hold that value. Furthermore, you were buying wine untasted and unseen. So unlike the rest of the world, you, not, you didn't get to taste the wines beforehand. Well, how and why could you make decisions about buying them? A lot of times, and I've had some British buyers, they bought because they knew the wine and wanted to honor the winery and wanted to see the wine develop. And so they would continue to buy a particular wine that they loved. But a lot of American buyers that I deal with would have to rely on press meaning relying on people who got to taste beforehand and base their purchases on what that person said or did. Now, I can tell you that in the US, I think the dominant person, and really to the point of having a monopoly on Bordeaux Futures, was Robert Parker. And I can understand that you might question this, and certainly I think his influence has faded a little bit, but it's fascinating because you can look up in the history when he actually had to have back surgery and he missed the Bordeaux futures tasting and Bordeaux futures dropped by 20% because he wasn't there to rate them. So it's a fascinating thing of that you can taste a, a certain people, press can taste beforehand, and if that wine gets a 98 points and it also gets 98 points at $50, it's going to sell much more strongly. I think this has become one of the controversies of Bordeaux over the years, and to this point in time, 2020, it's fascinating to note that Wine Spectator, another very dominant and prominent wine magazine in the United States, actually backed out of tasting wine futures. And I somewhat have to agree with them with the idea that tasting and rating beforehand and then two years later, the wine coming out doesn't do American consumers much good. Because if they rate the wine 98 points, and the Chateau first releases it at $50, it'll all sell out. But Chateaus have gotten fairly smart about that, so they'll just release 10, 20% of the production, see if it sells, and if it does, they'll raise the price. This means that futures aren't always necessarily a bargain. Okay, that was a lot of wine economics, but I think a fascinating one for those of you who choose to love and buy Bordeaux because the system is still in place now to this day, and it still goes on with this chart as well. 
Let's get back to that Bronerga crew and let's introduce the next village that we have. If you remember from our Belgrave, we were up in the Olmedoc near San Steph, the hunting lodge. Here we're down in San Julien, which is the middle of the villages. It sits between um, Puyac and Margot. And oftentimes San Julien is thought to have it all, but maybe in a mild way or a not as dramatic way in a more balanced way, if you will. The thought being that San Julien actually has the most second growths, being 14 of them there, whereas Puyac has the power and Margot has the elegance to it. San Julien combines those two and gives you an excellent balance. Now, like I said, Brunner de Cru for many years was considered a very modern style of making Bordeaux. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think the issue with that is that the property for in the 50s and 60s and 70s kind of floundered as a fourth growth and wasn't making fourth growth style of wine. It was purchased in the 80s, massive reinvestment followed, and some of that reinvestment was aimed at making modern winemaking techniques and also usage of modern winemaking techniques like new barrels and better viticulture. So here I think of beautiful rendition of San Julien, and I think with this vintage, one that will open up and continue to grow and be alive for at least 15 more years. Now, continuing with all those thoughts, we have our last wine of this flight, which is Chateau Giscor. And Giscor actually directly follows in the path of Brunner de Cru. Giscor is a third growth. So now we're moving up the chain, fifth, fourth, third, and it'll be up to you to taste and smell back and forth and drink back and forth and decide if the pyramid makes sense to you in quality. And you can see the pyramid is working on our price sheets in terms of price as well. Giscours is an interesting one though, because it's one that has been bought recently and has a similar story of Brunner de Cru with massive reinvestment and frankly, by the 2015 vintage, becoming biodynamic. I had the privilege of meeting the new winemaker of Giscor, and he said to me, well, I should give his back resume a little bit. He had been the assistant winemaker at Latour, a famous first growth, and probably the famous first growth, if you will, although all five of them are delicious, particularly if someone else is paying for them. But he had been the assistant winemaker of Latour, and when I met him at Giscours, which was his new job, he said, well, you know, making Latour is a privilege. It is considered one of the five best wines in the world. And it's a mark on my resume that, you know, I can't get anywhere else, and I'm so appreciative to having done it. But on the other hand, when you're making Latour, you are always going to be making Latour. You are held to a standard and you are supposed to hit that standard all the time. You don't have a chance really to innovate. You don't have a chance to take something new and create it and make it better. You are making one of the best wines in the world and that's the mission. With Giscor, as he said, it was an exciting opportunity because new ownership had brought new life to a third growth and they wanted to make the wines better and were willing to explore all kinds of possibilities to make those wines better, including biodynamic agriculture, all kinds of different things to do in the winery to make those wines better. So a chance to reinvigorate the property. For us, I think this is interesting because Giscors maybe in the 70s, even though it was a third growth, was not thought of as something special. And here, and I know this maybe sounds ridiculous when discussing a $90 wine, I think it's a wine that may perform at one of the top second growths right now, but is slightly underpriced compared to those second growths. So an interesting fragmentation in our structure here. And while I told you that economics and wine buying generally follows this structure, there are some very significant things that are often posted about these wines that alter them. There are wines, like Chiscor as a third growth, but there are wines that are second growths that often are better than the first growths or thought to be better than the first growths. 
Those lines are called super seconds. Now it's fascinating because if you go through the Grand Cru Class A system and you find those second growth lines, one thing you'll notice is that the super seconds are often now priced uh, near or close to the level of first growths. Not always, but can perform up there at the level of first growths. So super seconds, they sit at this level legally and always have, but act maybe like first growths. The other thing that's fascinating is fifth growths. There are some super fifth growths that people think taste and act like second growths. And there are also ones that are fascinating because they kind of disrupt and violate our understanding of this pyramid if you're looking at it from those economic perspectives of how and why these bottles of wine cost uh, the way they do. Now let's return to this glass of wine though and let's take our next village on the left bank. So we had a little bit of San Estef and we had a little bit of San Julien and now we're going to go to the village of Margot. And Margot, to me, is always very noticeably identifiable, and however you choose to call it, but Margot's, to me, always smell like cocoa powder. Coffee, mocha, cocoa powder. It's funny because I would normally say those things are associated with barrel, meaning that they smell of the oak that's being used. But in this case, with Margot, all Margots seem to smell that way. And they smell very different than San Julien's, and they don't smell anything like Pouillac's or Saint-Emilion's. And this is an example of that. I think very strongly smells of Margot. And so returns us to the idea that the wine can taste like the place it's from, even though we have all of this other hoopla going on in the background. So for us in this light, fifth growth, fourth growth, and third growth. Now we, of course, at Waterford Wine sell second growths and first growths. I was looking to try and keep this flight in a manageable position for most people to enjoy, but if you want either one of those, we can certainly supplement for you. Thank you.